Welcome to the 29th episode of Dialogika. I am Stephanie Tangkilisan. And I'm Sweden Lee. And this is we're going to talk about Anis Baswedan, the next governor of Jakarta, who won by a large margin in the recent gubernatorial election. We're going to talk a little bit about the stats regarding his victory on April 19th. And then we're going to dig deep into who Anis is, unpack a little bit about his background as an educator and minister, and what it's going to be like with him as the next governor. And we're going to also talk about the concerns we had during the campaign and the concerns going forward as Chinese Indonesians and as minorities in this country. So here's to it. Dua. 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 So on April 19th, Jakarta came out to vote on the second round of the gubernatorial race, and this time it was between Ahok Jarot and Anis Sandi. And what you just heard were people counting the votes at the polling station in West Jakarta. They kept saying two to indicate that somebody has voted for Ahok, but as we know, as the day went by, that wasn't the case. And by the early afternoon when the polls closed, it was pretty clear what the results were, weren't they? Anis Sandi won by 57.9%. Ahok lost by 42%. And yeah, actually, as I remember watching the quick count results, Ahok never... It was yeah, Aho quickly. never recovered. Like once Anis started to build up the lead, he always had the lead. Some math <laughs> done by we can um, do math too, guys. <laughs> he said from Peterpolitik.com, and he crunched the numbers, and he found that out of forty kecamatan or subdistricts of Jakarta, Aho only won seven of forty, whereas Anis won thirty-three out of forty. Yeah, out of thirty-three subdistricts, twenty-eight out of thirty-three voted over 20% for Anis, which means it overwhelmingly won for Anis. And as a whole, it resulted in almost 900,000 people voted more in favor of Anis over Ahok. So it was a very big Yeah, it's margin. almost a million votes, right? And it's, it's shocking to think that, you know, only a few months ago, nobody thought this was possible. You know, Anis only joined the race in late September. But this has been, I think the most heated gubernatorial race of all of Indonesian times. And I think... Literally, if you talk to anybody outside of Jakarta, they know about this race. You know, I was in Bali a few weeks before the election and people were talking about like, oh, is Ahok going to win? Like, what's the situation like? Is it really tense? Like, everybody really cared about this case. I mean, this race. I think even um, there were a lot of international attention about this race because basically more than just a gubernatorial race, I think the race stood for something bigger than just who would become governor, but it's almost like a race for the soul of Jakarta and Indonesia itself. Because I think leading up to this race, uh, it was it became about Ahok, who was Christian mm-hmm. and Chinese Indonesian, a double minority in Indonesia, versus Anis Baswedan, who is uh, Islam and very much gaining the support of the more radical and um, extremist part of the Islamic vote as well as the moderate Islamic vote, right? Yeah. So it became about like whether Indonesia is still a democracy that respected the multiculturalism of our country, or especially since Anis Baswedan courted the Islamic Defenders Front or FPI, a uh, radical Islamist extremist group behind Ahok's blasphemy charge. Yeah. I mean, this was in many ways, it's kind of, it's kind of crazy to think about this because Jakarta itself is very diverse, it's very multicultural. So a lot of the conversations that are happening during this race about values, about, you know, the national identity was in many ways not about Jakarta at all, right? It was about... It's about the nation's soul. Yeah. And somehow to put all that pressure onto the shoulders of these two men, it's a lot. And, you know, we've actually, intentionally or not, we've covered this race in many different ways and many different angles throughout previous yeah. episodes, whether that's about Aho's leadership style, how he's um, running as an independent candidate for a hot sec, <laughs> only hot sec, and then, you know, breaking down the different gubernatorial candidates' stances on things. Mm-hmm. So we've been focusing on this for a long time, and 
it's kind of weird to think that it's all over and it's such a yeah. sad result for us. This election felt so long, dude. It was it was bloody. It was messy. It was like a roller coaster of different emotions because Ahok um, was also mostly in a court for this time, and then there were a lot of demonstrations that shut down the city. So, by the way, listeners, if you can't figure it out by now, uh, Stephanie and I uh, are not happy by these results, and we'll dig deeper into why we're not happy about the fact that Anis is going to be our next governor for the next five years. So after um, we found out the results of the election, uh, I went to a feminist best organizational meeting. And this is a recording from Bagus, a student, um, and he's Javanese. So he's not Chinese Indonesian. And this was his response to my question, how does he feel about the results of Ahok's loss? He doesn't sound too happy there. I think also a lot of people who are more on the marginal end, who are not, you know, like Japanese, straight, Muslim, are, are also unhappy because they kind of felt like this was the beginning of Indonistan and like... I think what also pissed a lot of people off, you know, whether or not they're Chinese, Indonesians, or um, Javanese is that we all know Aho did a good job because his approval ratings are 70% and up. Uh-huh. Like everybody agree, you know, like the majority of the Jakarta population agree that Aho did a great job. And yet, and yet, he lost resoundingly. So I think that's what everybody's like. This is clearly not a decision made purely out of his, the efficacy of his policies and the effectiveness of his administration. It's about everything else. And should it be about everything else is the big question now. Like, is this how democracy is going to play out in our country? Is it no longer going to be about whether or not the person elected does his or her job? Yeah. You know? So this is the quote from Alisa Wahid of Wahid Institute. And she said, I am scared for the swinging pendulum of social change, especially in the Muslim community. They use mosques to spread hateful sentiments, and I am scared of the repercussions. So the Wahid Institute is an institute created by Abdul Rahman Wahid. He was a former president of Indonesia and one of the most noted uh, moderate Islamic figures of the Nadiatul Ulama, which is the big moderate Muslim organization, was very important in, you know, making sure the Islamic influences in Indonesia were moderating and like scholarly and useful for the country. Yeah, very sort of like um, tolerant Islam, right? very tolerant Islam. This was the Islam that I think we all grew up with and um, were very proud of in terms of like how different it was from Wahhabi Arab Islam that is increasingly coming into Indonesia. So this is also the kind of Islam that the NU is fighting ISIS in terms of like creating um, different tafsirs, different interpretations in the and the, on the internet basically to counter like the influence of ISIS abroad etc so um, yeah it's like really yeah really important and kind of troubling that the NU is kind of like losing its power in Indonesia and the FBE is gaining a lot of influence in Indonesia and part of it is because Abdul Rahman Wahid has already passed away mm-hmm. and there's no really big charismatic figure to lead the NU or the moderate Islamic parties it used to be that people thought Anis was a big part of this moderate Islamic wave and like could be a charismatic figure to lead this movement but he is clearly not. <laughs> right? Like a lot of people have been saying for years now, since I think the late 2000s, that Anis is this up and coming star in the moderate Islam scene. Like, you know, he can, he's a, he's a educated guy. He's very smart. He's the leader of a moderate. Let's go back to who Anis is. Let's go back to the details on who Anis is and 
why he became such a disappointment. <laughs> that is so true. That is a great encapsulation of who he is right now. Um, so Anis Baswedan uh, graduated with a bachelor's degree in economics from University of Gajabada. Which one of the best Indonesian universities. Yeah. And, so, and then he also got his master's in public policy from the University of Maryland, as well as a PhD in political science. From Northern Illinois University. Yeah, he's been named on a lot of lists as like up and coming intellectuals, somebody to look forward to. And he was the rector of Paramadina University. He became the youngest rectors in Paramadina history. And he was like, you know, I think I used to really admire him and think that he was like a super cool dude. Mm-hmm. Um, basically, he was also really instrumental in creating Indonesia Mangaja, which is the colon of Teach for America, except it translates literally to Teach for Indonesia, in which it sends some of Indonesia's brightest all around to different provinces of Indonesia to teach. Um, and then part of that also became why he was eventually appointed by President Jokowi to become the Minister of Education and Culture, um, although that was also in big part due to his very influential part that he played in the Jokowi JK presidential campaign of 2014 where he was a spokesperson and um, mm-hmm. a former guest of, and friend of the podcast Farina Sintu Morang also worked with him and, and told me you know like he was like super instrumental and like super insightful and super smart in that campaign and like was a big part of how Jokowi won like he did a lot of like really good campaigning and like really good strategy, strategy building and strategy making. Um, in two thousand fourteen, he was you know uh, be- became officially a minister of education. But in just two years, he was fired. Yes, he was one of the. He was actually one of the high profile ministers who was dropped from yeah. the post following rumors of inefficiency, corruption, and and this is his desire to run for presidency in two thousand nineteen. So it's actually a big slap in the face to be dropped, and uh, in terms of like being fired like this very 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 rarely happens because like indonesia is all about you know saving face etc so it was like a real slap in the face to like be let go because of like supposed inefficiencies and it's also telling i mean a lot of people since i think 2014 when he was the spokesperson for the jokowi jaga campaign a lot of people have been talking about oh is he somebody who's going to potentially run for presidency in the future, a rising leader. Those rumors never really gone away. And Anis himself has never really shied away from those rumors. No, he's never directly or indirectly confirmed anything. So I think that also probably turned off Jokowi when he was minister. You know, Anis was definitely a minister that wanted the limelight, wanted to be in the spotlight, had a really huge social media presence, had a really huge fan base. To the point where he made like videos in social media was like, I'm sorry, I have to leave my post. Here's all the things I did. Remember me fondly? <laughs> yeah. I still remember those posts. But yeah, I mean, that's honest, right? Like he, I think a lot of the promise that people have expected from him from his rector days was kind of eroded during his ministerial career. And so I think he came into uh-huh. it. He came into the campaign trail with a little bit of a bruised reputation, right? Yeah. Maybe he wanted to, I don't know, redeem himself or prove himself. Yeah. Like he can actually survive in the politics race. But anyways, so in late September, he joined with Sandy as literally the last person to join a ticket. You know, he was the last person to form a ticket with Sandy. And that in itself, you know, we've talked about in previous episodes was a surprising choice because a lot of people thought Sandiaga Uno was going to be the governor, gubernatorial candidate. But in fact, it was Anis and everybody was like, why, you know, he was the one who was invited to join the ticket. Why is he going to be the head honcho in this, in the number one? So uh, questions about his ego and about his ambitions start to rise up again. Um, yeah, I mean, he's like a noted, notably like very ambitious even from like a very young age that's sort of like the context of who this guy is and why people feel the way they do about him and then i think you know if we look into what he has said and the kind of people he's hung around with during the campaign it's only done worse to his reputation at least in the eyes of those who thought he was a progressive liberal moderate muslim leader i just remember like people being 
even people who work with Indonesia Mengajar are being very disappointed because um, they're like, you know, people remember him being like, you know, the only the only way evil continues is for good men to do nothing. That's like something he was known to say a lot. And now he's like, not only not doing nothing, but actively participating in creating a hostile environment for Indonesia's uh, minorities. That's, I think, the most frustrating thing for me is that this is a guy who flip-flopped in my opinion you know he's changed his position drastically in order to meet his own political agenda like how can you trust this guy that's i mean i i don't want us to take it too far as well in terms of like i don't think anis is a good person but i don't think he is that bad i think the circumstances to his election and what he's saying is bad, but I don't know if his programs are necessarily that bad either. And I think that people need to remember that Ahok was also not a good governor for the marginalized poor either. He was a good governor for the marginalized privileged people, but not necessarily for the, the people who were forced relocated. So like, I think you need to take both things with a grain of salt. Like, If Ahok was the perfect politician... In terms of being able to be more eloquent, being being able to like um, control his mouth better, and you know like you know done the relocation with a lot more humanitarian efforts, I think things could have turned out differently as well. And I think the one thing we need to realize, I think for me in particular through this election, is that I think Chinese Indonesians and a lot of people were under the delusion that being Chinese and Indonesian and being a minority shouldn't be a factor anymore. I think we were under the illusion that we progress as a society and that we were the same as non-minorities here. But I think my biggest takeaway is that we are minorities and we should not take that for granted. We need to perform better. We need to be better educated. We need to be more eloquent, more measured, and just better at how we are as an individual because we're just going to be scrutinized more no matter what we do. So we do have to become unimpeachable in our morality and our, you know, act as, you know, corruption or or just like not be in the ball game because that's where we are in society right now and we need to accept that. So that's your pragmatic self talking, right? Because I feel like if the the stuff in the I know like in terms of your ideal like democratic self would be like we should not have to be in that position. It should be an equal society. But it's yeah, not. Yeah, we shouldn't be in that position. But we shouldn't fool ourselves to thinking that we're there yet. I mean, I think that's why a lot of people were sad instead of angry or any other pr- emotion. is because I think deep down we know we're just not there yet. And we cannot hope to be there. And there's still a lot of and hard work, right? It's still very easy. I mean, it's good that this election came in a fairly good economic year and uh, under a president who still cares for our well-being right um i think it's sort of like the more cynical side of me came back and be like okay yeah this is where we are and we just have to accept it and move on with the knowledge that we're always going to be marginalized and unaccepted in some way so we just have to know how to position ourselves in the society If anything, I think it's important for us to see this and know that if we want to make a change in politics and be involved in politics, we need to, one, organize, and two, actually participate in politics itself. And that's reminding people that, you know, if you just complain about politics and you're not actually being a part of it, it's it's just kind of, like, difficult as well. And it's never going to change. Like, I think we need to know that, you know, at least for me, I know at some point I'll want to join a political office in some way. Um, it's just that... You heard it here first, uh, listeners. I, 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 I want my niece first because I like nice food. And Simona next is an expensive dog to take care of. I will say this, though. You know, despite all the doom and gloom that we might have projected or not, 
Um, democracy happened. Yeah. It happened and it functioned well. In terms of you know, relative to Indonesia, it was a fairly good day of voting. <laughs> Certainly, it was a high turnout. And even during the debates previously, whether in the second round or the first round, there were really constructive conversations happening around policy, around important issues. Yeah. So I think the takeaway here is that even though it's not the right result for people like us, it doesn't mean that the democracy isn't growing. Yeah. But it does mean that if we want the democracy to grow in what we think uh, is the right way to grow, then we have to work hard and we have to participate in order to steer it toward that, that way because we're not there. Nobody's steering it towards more progressive values. It still hurts. Oh. I thought the gap will be narrower. Yeah. It, it, it does hurt. Tapi kayak karena 71 tahun Indonesia merdeka tapi manusianya masih seperti ini. Democracy is about what most people want and what I think we're just not we just are in a place where what we want is not what most people want. Thank you so much for listening to us this week. Uh, we hope you kind of took away something from it. As always, um, music credits to Jazzart, Ryan Little, and Bro for Free. And if you haven't followed us on YouTube, um, our latest channel, uh, you should definitely follow us. Yeah. We're also still going to be on SoundCloud, but we want to uh, highlight YouTube a bit more. And also, it's a lot easier, I guess, to listen on YouTube than, yeah. say, like open up SoundCloud or you know go into iTunes and download the podcast. So we're trying to make it easier for you guys to, to, listen. Uh, to enjoy the episodes. Yeah. And once again, we always, always really want feedback. So email us at dialogicapodcast at gmail.com or send us a Facebook message or comment on YouTube. And as always, uh, we'll have resources and links at our website, dialogica.id. And thanks so much for listening.